Uh, so I recommend, I recommend, uh, I recommend you guys. Okay, let's take a. Are you are you in a time constraint? I forgot to ask you. Not a particular one. So let's take some um, some concepts from the left. Um, one of my favorite, uh, or the ones I, I hate the most, I guess, is is privilege, and the whole idea of white privilege, but just the way they use the term privilege, which is. So why is that a a package deal? Right. Yeah, so take privilege even before this latest um, kind of woke usage of it, mm -hmm. uh, where it's racialized and genderized. But take like, you know, I'm privileged. I grew up in an upper middle class family. We had money and this and that, as opposed to the underprivileged youth, right, where it's yes. just economic. Um, the concept of a privilege in the original meaning of it, the earlier meaning was like something granted by a king or nobility or royalty. Uh, in a more general usage, um, it's a, a a special good thing. Yep. What a privilege to be on your show, Iran, or something. I'm privileged to meet you. So there's a, a specifically older political usage and then a more general usage where it's like a kind of rare positive thing. Now, when you talk about rich people as being privileged or even middle class people or you know most people as being privileged relative to the underprivileged or disadvantaged right you're presenting it as a kind of rare special treat or advantage that certain people got and specifically now suggesting that it's politically a rare special treat or advantage that people got and something about it it's being a privilege requires that it's specialness or unusualness is part of its goodness. So if you're privileged to meet somebody, it's because not everybody can meet that guy. You've had the rare privilege of getting to meet him. Um, if your being wealthy is a privilege, it's because not everybody's wealthy and you, and so you, you have less privilege if everybody becomes rich. Right? So there's a kind of zero sum uh, special, anything you have is a, a special thing that you're having it requires other people not to have it to conceptualize any value or positive thing you have as a privilege. And particularly when you start thinking of a right as a privilege in that sense, it's, uh, it's really dangerous because then you're thinking, you know, well, I would be losing my rights if he got them. Um, again, in this meaning of privilege, there's like privileges and immunities, a constitutional meaning. Um, so now we have a kind of, so this usage of privilege, this kind of economic early 20th century, the privileged versus the underprivileged, is I think a kind of Marxist way of conceiving of wealth, right? And it's already a, a package deal between special favors and political grants, just nice things that are unusual, and uh, being wealthy or comfortable, um, however that came about. And it's treating it as something that didn't have causes, or at least didn't have causes in anyone's virtue. So would you say, in a sense, politically, from the economic perspective, it's a, it's a package deal of an aristocrat who attains his wealth in a particular way, and a capitalist who attains it in a particular way and, and in a sense is done purposefully to obliterate yeah. the difference. I think originally an aristocrat and a capitalist, but then like an aristocrat and anyone who's not poor, um, which, at which point it becomes less and less plausible. Uh, and it's got, in addition to that, aristocratic wealth and the privileges of an aristocrat require other people not to have them exactly. in a way that wealth real wealth doesn't, right? You, you're wealthier if other people around you are richer, uh, not poorer if other people around you are richer. Um, so it's a package deal, yeah, between aristocratic status and wealth, a wealth that could be earned. Um, and now we, um, the, the, the move to white privilege, male privilege, cis privilege, et cetera, right, is now just extending that to... Um, People, it's treating people who are now not unjustly treated as their lack of a certain unjust treatment um, being a royal political kind of privilege, constituting an aristocracy. And that, I think, is really wrong, and uh, it's false, and it's super dangerous to the very people who it's allegedly designed to protect. I mean, you couldn't come up with a better program for um, electing racists yep. than to uh, recast uh, ra racial injustice, which I think there is a significant amount of still in America, um, as racial privilege that white people have. If black people are mistreated, are treated unjustly, 
How is that a privilege to me? Just because I'm not also treated unjustly in the same way? Would I not be? Suppose there are stores that are following around their black patrons and shouldn't be because they're suspicious of them being thieves when they shouldn't be. That doesn't make it makes me worse off, not better off, or or at best it leaves me neutral um, because they're not also following me. I mean, it's all of these kinds of things. If 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 the the the, the conceiving of them as privilege is serves the function of making white people feel like they benefit from them. Mm-hmm. And that's supposed to be in order to guilt them into doing something about them. But um, one, it's unearned guilt in many cases. And two, it's not going to motivate that. It's going to motivate a backlash, which is right. what we've seen that it has done. Absolutely. And it's, it, it really, there's a sense in which it assumes the natural state is one of discrimination in one of, of really, really bad stuff happening, you know, which I think intersectionality assumes that that's just the nature of things that we all, you know, we all discriminate against somebody, right? Um, and that therefore, if you're not discriminated against, that's, that's, the, that's the privileged position. That's something unique. That's something special. That's something different. Yeah, now there are, you know, mixed into all of this discourse, you know, some legitimate points that need to get, should be get, should get addressed in some way or other. And th- that I think this whole way of thinking about it draws attention away from. So the, the original concept of intersectionality, which I don't think is really the name from the leftist perspective of, of this worldview, but is um, that, you know, it's not enough to say, you know, we have to worry about discrimination against blacks or women or whatever, but there might be special forms of discrimination you face if you're at the intersection of two of these things. Yeah, that's probably true. If you're concerned to fight discrimination against blacks and against women, you might not notice that, like, black women are getting treated in some way that doesn't quite track either of those. Um, Okay, fine. There's also the point, I mean, not fine, that's something we should be aware of and think about, but it's not to do with privilege. And then the other thing that comes up under the heading of privilege a lot now is the idea that it's easy to be unaware of injustices when you're not the victim of them. Yep. And it's easy, therefore, to engage in behaviors or tolerate behaviors that serve to perpetuate the injustice um, uh, and not to take actions that would, would uh, eliminate it. And I think that's really true, too. And there are lots of examples of that that could be focused on. But when you really think about those examples and focus on them, you see that it's in your interest. It, uh, if you're a member of the non-persecuted uh, group, non-discriminated against group, to broaden your awareness, to notice these things, and to try to fight them, and to try to change them, to try not to engage in um, actions that are examples of or perpetuate injustice, and to try to fill in whatever blind spots you may have to the best of your ability. When you treat it as a privilege that you don't have to do so, uh, it just makes people defensive and it's not, uh, it's not, doesn't work. And it hasn't been working, I don't think. Or, or now there even seems to be the approach that you can't, that is, you can't change those things within you or outside, you know, this is the whole white fragility. You are racist by, almost by definition of being white and, and you're, you know, you, you pretending that you have black friends or you pretending that you treat people of other colors uh, equally. That's just pretense. There's no way that is true. And that you can't change it. All you can do is admit to your guilt. I mean, there's a question as to, from a certain perspective, it's guilt. I think the people who were, who are um, promulgating this, if they were here, would say, well, it's not guilt. What you, you have to recognize is that you're in a system that you can't get out of. And uh, a lot of things that are claimed to be showing that you're not racist are just ways of uh, evading or covering up the, the, like if you say you're, so one thing the anti-racist people say that I think is, is true is that a, a lot of professions of colorblindness are attempts to dodge the issue that makes you feel uncomfortable. And there's a point to that. Yeah, you do notice in many contexts, at least when people are black and white and so forth, and um, you might not make a big deal of it, but maybe it has some effects and you should think about what does it and whatever. But, um, it's although, but the the whole rhetoric of it, the whole rhetoric of it as a privilege and as fighting your privilege and using your privilege for this and that privilege, it, particularly with the baggage privilege carries, does have the tone of of you're supposed to feel bad about anything good that you have, 
that you get. It creates a kind of original th sin kind of thinking. And again, it, it reads defensiveness and reflects the idea that benefits to co some come at the expense to others. And that therefore, um, what you have to do if you're white, male, cis, etc., cetera, uh, straight, what you have to do is sacrifice and you'll never have sacrificed enough. And in fact, what you have to do to correct what injustices there actually are is never to sacrifice. And so long as people see it in those terms, the problems can't be solved. And if you think of racial problems that have been, if not solved, mitigated, and gender inequality issues that have been mitigated, it has not come from this kind of um, uh, demonizing of one position or uh, um, thinking you have to give something up. It's come from seeing how it is better for everyone to get rid of an injustice. Mm -hmm. So another anti-concept, I think it's an anti is anti-racism, which is connected to the whole idea of, of, of privilege. Yeah, it's become one. And here I want, this is one where I don't know if it's worth saving or not. Um, you know, anti-communism, anti-fascism is another example of this. So literally, you know, there's fascism and there's opposing fascism. So you're anti-fascist. But um, from a, a long time ago, I mean, from the, you know, middle of the 20th century in Europe, uh, it was anarchists and communists who claimed the mantle of being the anti-fascists and they organized under this banner. And now we have these kind of Antifa movements in America. It's not an organization per se, but a kind of, you can call it a movement. And so is anti-race, and, and it doesn't stand for just being against fascism. It stands for a particular vaguely anarchic um, political orientation, mm -hmm. which casts itself as anti-fascist. Uh, what about anti-racism? Well, racism is bad. We should think about what things can be done to prevent racism, and anti-racism is a perfectly sensible term for the project of not only not being a racist, but trying to work actively to combat or dismantle uh, racial prejudice and racism in institutions. So it would be like anti-communist, which would be fine. But more and more today, it's standing for a particular ideology based on critical race theory, which is a kind of Marxist view of racism that includes a particular view of the races and a particular view of race relations and of what's to be done about it. And um, uh, so that's all packaged in with just opposing racism. And the more that that term becomes associated with that brand name of uh, ways to fight racism, the, so that, you know, um, the, the the less one, the, the more one should issue that term. It's becoming a package deal. Or it's become one in a lot of lips. And the question is, do people who really want to fight racism but in a different way try to reclaim the term anti-racist and say, you guys aren't real anti-racists, so you're not anti-racists of the right sort? Or do, uh, or do we say, no, anti-racism is one of these co-opted terms. What we really are are people who favor genuine racial justice or the dismantling of racism or whatever it is. Are they so trying to obliterate the con the idea of colorblindness? Um, well, colorblindness is another one of these things that's become a package deal, right? So is it an ideal that we want a society in which people aren't judged at all on their color? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a good thing. Or is it the claim that I'm oblivious to color? Yeah. And if I'm oblivious to people's, I mean, there was a good sign that someone held at one of these rallies called, that said the problem with colorblindness is you can't see patterns. And so if you really can't tell if someone's black or white, and it's the case that a lot of your neighbors can, and they're like hurting black people and not white people, and you don't notice it because you're, yep. yeah, that would be a problem. So what uh, what is meant by colorblindness? And if it's meant that we don't, so, I mean, I think it's become a kind of vague term you, as used both by people who are for it and by people who are against it. You don't think Martin Luther King used it that? In no, the... I don't. I think it's become that way since. And I think the ideal of a colorblind society is something we should be striving towards. I think we have to and recognize that we're further from that than a lot of us had hoped yep. uh, 10 or 20 years ago. And that recognizing that is a part of getting there. And I do think that that um, a lot of the current way people talk about anti-racism um, is predicated on the idea that you can never get there. Yep. 
I think that's right. Okay. Um, any other any other package deals, anti concepts you want to cover? And then we've got some super chat questions, if you don't mind. I don't have some another. Related, related. Some unrelated. We got through two right wing ones, two left wing ones, as they're being yep. said today. So I think we've been uh, fair in our targets. Fair so and nice. balanced. Fair and balanced. All right. Uh, let's... That's another one is used by uh, various news shows that you said. Yes, I, mean, I know. Let's... <laughs> I know. Uh, let's I'm not sure ahead. what what the anti concept is there, fair or balanced. So I guess both of them. Um, but because the, the yeah. Um, why? So I think this question relates to white privilege, and it's asking. Let me see if I can find the original. I think it relates to that. What's a better name for it? We can't ignore the marketing. They need a quick way to address the proper white privilege points, Greg mentioned. Um, so I'm not a great marketer of coming up with terms, but there's um, white blindness, which I've sometimes heard uh, for, would be better than white privilege. Like the, in general, the, if the point that you want to make is that um, when you're in a group that's not suffering from a certain kind of discrimination or injustice, it's easy to be oblivious to it. Mm -hmm. Then, um, you know, the obliviousness of non-victims or the blindness of non-victims or the difficulty of the blind spots of non-victims. Yeah. And then if you want to say that it's particularly white people who have this because you're interested in the racial version of it, as opposed to the gender or gay or whatever version of it, then you could say, um, you know, white blind spots or white blindness or something like that would be a plausible way to describe it. So long as you don't take it as, as white blindness might uh, take it. It's impossible to ever become aware of these things. There are things that'll be kind of more obvious to you if you're a victim of it. Um, and, uh, but you could learn to see it if you're not. And also we don't want to allow that, like, you know, uh, if you are in a discriminated against class, you are therefore automatically super alert to all the kinds of discrimination and accurate about them. I've known a, a bunch of women, for example, who, you know, Say, I've never been discriminated against for a woman. And then somebody says, yeah, what about that time when that happened to you? And says, well, maybe, I don't know. And so who's right? Which of the two? Like, it's, you know, it's not like if you're someone who might face discrimination because of sex, race, whatever it is, that you're therefore infallibly a good judge of, of which cases are cases of it. But you do have an advantage in spotting it over, over uh, people who don't. So um, something like blindness or blind spots, I think is the right rhetoric for that. What we need today, what I call the new intellectual, would be any man or woman who is willing to think. Meaning, any man or woman who knows that man's life must be guided by reason, by the intellect, not by feelings, wishes, whims, or mystic revelations. Any man or woman who values his life and who does not give, want to give in to today's cult of despair, cynicism, and impotence and does not intend to give up the world to the dark ages and to the rule of the collectivist brute. All right, before we go on, reminder, please like the show. We've got 163 live listeners right now, uh, 30 likes. That should be at least 100. I figure at least 100 of you actually like the show. Maybe there are like 60 of the Matthews out there who hate it. But, but at least the people who are liking it, you know, I want to see I want to see a thumbs up. There you go. Start liking it. I want to see that go to 100. All it takes is a click of a, a click of a, a thing, whether you're looking at this. Uh, and, and, you know, the likes matter. It, it's not an issue of my ego. It's an issue of the algorithm. The more you like something, the more the algorithm likes it. So, you know, and if you don't like the show, give it a thumbs down. Let's see your actual views being reflected in the likes. But uh, if you like it, don't just sit there, help get the show promoted. Of course, you should also share, and uh, you can support the show at youronbrookshow.com slash support or on Patreon or Subscribestar or Locals uh, and, uh, and show your support for, all, for, for, for the work, for the value, hopefully, you're receiving from this. And, uh, and of course, don't forget, if you're not a subscriber, even if you... Even if you just come here to troll, or even if you're here like Matthew to defend Marx, uh, then uh, you should subscribe, because that way you'll know when to show up. You'll know what shows are on, when they're on. You'll get notified, right? 
So, um, yes, like, share, subscribe, support. Like, share, subscribe, support. There you go. Easy. Do one or all of those, please.